Welcome to the show. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Blake, I feel like we just recorded an episode a couple of days ago, but we did because we were doing a little bit of catch up. But now we're uh, we're just back at our normal Friday. We're a couple minutes late today, but we're a normal Friday live stream. Yeah, streaming live. We'll see if anyone joins us. Great to see you, David. Um, and your mind router you? hasn't melted like nothing. <laughs> Because I know these headlines no. in the news, Arizonans, man. I tweeted, I said, every summer now, the New York Times does this big cover story about how Phoenix is melting and we're having record heat and nobody can live in this desert. And I think to myself, okay, what about all these northern states where you have sub-zero temperatures for like months? And if you didn't have heat or air conditioning or whatever you call it up there, you'd die. I mean, yeah. I, I feel we're better off here, honestly. But uh, I, I think it's part of the the whole like global warming story. So they gotta they gotta hit it. I've up always everybody. said it's easier to do the heat. You just take clothes off. You get a margarita. You can kind of deal with it. You go in the shade. You go to the lazy the cold, river. It's very hard to yeah. get away from cold. Even if you build a big fire, you can't get in the fire. Like <laughs> you're always gonna be a little cold. The uh, the, the city of Scottsdale, where I live, they have like a public lazy river that operates on Saturdays and Sundays. I mean, I feel like I live in a resort now that I live in, in Phoenix, but I don't <laughs> want to say that. Uh, ignore what I just said, because we don't want any more people moving here. We don't have enough water. So just stay where you are. Uh... Well, I think I saw uh, Arizona now flipped to one of the most expensive states. It went from like one of the cheapest places to move. Californians like you, Blake, have came in and messed up the whole entire economy of Arizona. <laughs> no, California, my Arizona. That's what those bumper stickers say, and I, I apologize. I'm so sorry, but I love Arizona. Um, gonna stay here forever now. I can't move. The interest rates are too low on my oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. mortgage. I've I, I thought about that. It's, yeah, a lot of people are gonna be locked in forever. But we should jump in. Uh, Let's the, talk about uh, the news. Yeah, the news. I mean, I want to get into. Uh, so you know, we talked about the whole big tax prep sharing data with Meta and Google. Well, Elizabeth Warren released a big report this week, so I want to talk about that. The IRS has decided they should not work on a new uh, self-filing tax system for taxpayers. They decided they not to do it. About. I thought they decided, I they well, were they're pushing back it. on doing it. So we can talk oh. about that. So, okay. and then uh, the only other, IR, and then some IRS news about how they're focused on security. Right. So, yeah. So you got the IRS beat. Okay. Well, uh, I have been blessed with another wall street journal story about the dearth of accountants. This headline is the dearth of accountants has now become visible in several financial reports with companies pleading difficulty in finding and retaining skilled people. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Um, but I guess before that, I have some good news, which is well, that the, congratulations. The, the startup that I was most recently working for, Giraffe, the FP&A startup, uh, I was running marketing there for a couple of years. They just raised $20 million in a Series B round. And the reason I am so excited about that is because once a startup raises their Series B, which is typically the third round of funding, you do an angel round, you do a Series A round, you do a Series B. Once you get to that Series B, your odds of survival go way up to, uh, I think it's two thirds. So there's a two thirds chance now that my stock <laughs> options, which I exercised, so my stock will actually be worth something. So it worked out for Flowcast because Flowcast did their Series C and Giraffe did their Series B. So now I might get lucky and have a twofer where the two tech companies that I worked for are going to pay out. Not a guarantee. No, because options are the options to not pay you. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way to think about those. So, so what you're basically saying, so if I'm, not, I'm an accountant at my firm, I'm going to go pick tech for my clients. I need to be checking, hey, did you get the Series B yet? Because that's I, I don't feel comfortable yeah. putting my clients on you. And that's why I brought this up. It's not to brag. It's uh, yeah. because you want to know as an accountant when you're buying software or when you know when you're subscribing to an app for your clients, what is the odds that this will be around in a year, in two years, in three years, maybe in ten years? Because it's, it's that long game, right? Yeah. It's a long game. It's a it's a lot of time and effort to implement software, and you don't want to have to switch if you don't have to. So, I if everybody little... has that mindset. New apps will never get past A. Exactly. So, well, and this is why it's it's challenging as a developer to get accountants to buy into your new startup because 
that's a natural question, right? Uh, and so I, I wanted to give our listeners some perspective on this and, and share some stats about survival rates of startups so that when you are looking at new tech for your firm, you can decide whether or not it's worth the risk. And there's this risk reward uh, to it. So we should be aware of it as accountants, right? That's our job is to analyze and assess risk in many ways, at least if you're a CPA that is drilled into your head over and over again. It sure, it sure was for me. Uh, so let's look at these stats. This is from uh, Louisa Joe, and she has a blog post on her site called Startup Failure Statistics, What Percentage of Startups Fail? So this is the scary part. Uh, nine out of 10 startups fail, okay? 90% of startups do not survive. I should thought it was even higher than that. But... Well, this is over the long run. Yeah. Uh, and you think about it, this is, this is not just tech companies. This is um, in, in all startups, yep. there's a pretty high failure rate. In tech, it can be high. This is specifically um, for tech, right? Nine out of 10 fail. All businesses have a 70% failure rate. So startups tend to fail more than uh, most businesses. Startups often take a lot longer to validate their place in the market than founders expect. They run out of cash, and that's typically why they fail. Not dissimilar to Main Street businesses, which tend to fail because they run out of cash. They don't have enough capital. They, they underestimated how long it would take for them to break even. They, they go out of business. Um, one out of 12 entrepreneurs succeeds in building a successful business. That's 8.3% just one in 12. So uh, most entrepreneurs who are successful typically had more than one stab at it. More than 50% of startups fail in their first five years. And like we said, most of those fail. Well, it's a plurality of those fail because they run out of cash. 38% run out of cash. 35% never find market fit. They build a product that nobody wants to buy. And then 20% I, fail because they get outcompeted. I'm surprised that the 39% is what it is. I, I think it's much higher. I think people build products that nobody wants all the time. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and that's why in startup circles, the, the advice you always hear is get to a product that people will pay for as soon as you possibly can. That's all about building that minimum viable product. Okay. And I think when you're doing an accounting firm and trying to run it like a startup, that's also super important. If you're productizing services, you got to get somebody to buy it. And that's well, we, how you validate that it. That was Meryl's story in last week's episode. That she started her new firm and within 14 days had a paying client. That was the focus. One yeah. paying client. Right? She was running it like a startup, like a tech startup. Um, I'm going to skip through a few of these stats here to get to the one that is related to this fundraising amount. Um, Oh, here's one that's interesting first. Time to profitability on average is four years. Okay, now let's get to the failure rate by years in business, okay? So in year one, 20% fail, year two, 30% fail, year five, 50% fail, year 10, 70% fail. But we were talking about the stage of funding. So there's a chart here that shows based on series, what is the failure rate? So if you are pre-seed or series A, your failure rate is 60%. So most startups fail before they get to a series B. 60% are going to fail. Once a startup has reached series B, they only have a 35% failure rate. So that's why I'm really happy about the giraffe fundraise. And once they reach series C, it's just 1%. So that's the thing I want everyone to remember. When you're looking at tech for your firm, if that company has gotten to Series C, they're going to be around. Yeah. You plus, I also worry. think even if they, um, I don't, yeah, they won't go out of business. But then there's so many investors involved, and there's so much money involved that they'll figure out how to do a deal with private equity, get bought or acquired. Like the, the investors are going to not lose all that money to Series C. It's just the, the discipline of their investment is different. Yeah. Thanks to Edgar, David. Ulysses, Christopher, for joining and chatting with us. Uh, we got a few questions about this, of course, coming in. Um, Ulysses says, how does this define a successful business, businesses that merely break even? I believe, if I'm reading this right, that success just means surviving. Um, 
not running out of cash, not going out of business. And that could also mean an acquisition. Yeah. So when you fail, that means like you shut down, bankrupt, that sort of thing. Um, so anyway, I thought that was an interesting stat, you know? And this is what I love about our show. Like you bring some story in this angle and I already had two stories are related. <laughs> so my first one, this is my comment I put on my story. Um, so the, the, the article title is Barry, a tech firm relocating to Europe, lays off most of staff. And it's about Evernote. And the note I wrote to myself is this the end of Evernote? Now I've been using Evernote. It was one of the, the first like cloud products that you could just pick up any device and any screen you have and your notes would be there. Right. Oh yeah. It was and, groundbreaking when it came out. It's been around for a while. And now you can like Google, everybody's like sliced and diced all their features. Like if you, if you have uh, one note from Microsoft, you basically don't need Evernote. If you have Google, if you're a Google drive person, you don't need Evernote. And it's kind of this, this sad erosion that's happened to that company over time. Now they've been sold to an Italian app maker called, map maker called Bending Spoons. And they say that they intend to keep it growing. They're going to invest in it. They have a 400 plus workflow, workforce at Bending Spoons. And some of them are, have been working on Evernote full time since the acquisition. But it's still a little like, now here, here's a company that never, I think they've had Series A, Series B, Series C type funding. But now maybe they're not going to go away, but man, it's been a rough ride. And I'm a little worried, like, mm. should I be making a backup plan? <laughs> Which Evernote was my backup of everything, right? Well, I, I did use Evernote at one point, but my concern was exactly what your concern is now, David, is that they have this proprietary format for the notes. And it's not really easy to export your stuff from Evernote into like an open format that you can easily use. Um, there are apps that will plug into it and like pull your notes out. I think Notion does that. You can plug Notion into Evernote and pull your stuff out into Notion. Or maybe through Zapier or something. I probably Yeah. It's like it's like fifteen it's years of notes. <laughs> Did I just burn here's, it all? Here's my question is how often do you go back and look at those notes? It, like it's not as frequent as I want, but it's always like oddball like PDFs of like, you know, some appraisal on a house or like there's always these things you you have to go and find eventually. So I, I could put them in a the Google Drive though. Like there's no reason they can't live somewhere yeah. else, but just archive it all. I've got some of that. And then um, an, another example is shutting down. Um Kodat, and we've talked about Kodat in the past. Kodat essentially is a middleman app that if I'm a develop if I'm giraffe and I don't want to write an integration to QuickBooks and Zero and NetSuite and QuickBooks Desktop and all these things, I could just write to Kodat, and Kodat has an API that connects to all the other accounting jails. It, it's a great promise, right? And we tried to build out at Intuit 12 years ago, one, one API for QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Desktop at the same time. Well, apparently Kodat's learning what Intuit learned a decade ago, that it's almost impossible to do and it's a little tough. So they're shutting down, they're not gonna let any more developers build desktop integrations. So this is going to be platforms like Dynamics 365, QuickBooks Desktop, uh, NetSuite, Sage 50, Sage Intact. They're actually even adding those in the list. And they, if you buy their enterprise plan, they'll let you integrate with those. But they're, it's very clear they do not want people to do that, and they're raising prices. right? So they, they're realizing that it, this is the, it's, it was impossible for Intuit to do it with two APIs. So imagine trying to do it for lots mm. of 40 GLs. It's, almost, it's really an impossible task. Um, so that's, that's being shut down. Going back to your Evernote issue, David, no. HK Geek in the live chat said, I moved meeting notes to Rocketbook now, then I scan it to a PDF and save that in my e-files. Then Keeper is my portal slash task management for ongoing tasks, et cetera. I think As that's... in Keeper, the accounting process app. Keeper. I think there's there's like a note-taking Keeper, isn't there as well? That's, that's no. how, If you could no. clarify quickly in the chat here. But... um. I think that's an interesting distinction is there's the archival purposes type notes, and then there's the current projects you're working on type notes. And I've taken the approach uh, for my archive. I actually have just Google Drive folders. Uh, I use Google Drive file stream on my Mac. So it's not taking up space on my local computer. It's just all streaming from the server. So anytime I need something to save something that I'm not working on that's for reference purposes, I use I use the um, getting things done methodology. And like once you're done with something, you're just supposed to put it in the file cabinet. And so that's my file cabinet. And I use PDF for as much stuff as I can because I know that'll be around forever. 
well, we say that, but <laughs> don't, don't jinx PDFs for all of us, Blake. <laughs> it's the most likely thing to be around forever because right, everything's saved as a PDF. For and you. arguably now, like OneDrive, like any device I pick up, I can access my docs and like, yeah, yeah it. Well, but you couldn't do that before. Like that's what's the beauty of Evernote. Yeah. But now it's and, like Evernote's pointless. And I would say, like when when you saved a PDF and you save it in like a OneDrive or a Google Drive, you're actually future proofing in the sense because now AI can go in and like read the text of all those PDFs and find everything you're looking for. So very soon, that search function that never seems to work yeah. right in any of these apps will work really good with Google and with Microsoft because the AI can do that. It can basically create uh, an LLM of your personal notes. And I have a story that we'll talk about later that about Google is working on that. So finally, we'll be able to find all that stuff that we have f filed away um, that we can never seem to find. Um, I've got a layoff story, David. This is a bit of schadenfreude for some of our listeners. I actually got emails from listeners letting me know that Pilot has laid off 13% of their workforce. It's 45 employees. And I, I want to say I am very sorry for these employees. I don't mean to uh, minimize the disruption that they're having from getting laid off and that it's never a, a good situation. I'm sorry for that. I'm sure they'll find jobs because every accountant can get a job if you know what you're doing these days. Uh, but it is amusing from a company perspective to see Pilot, which got venture funding from Jeff Bezos's personal VC fund, laying off people. Um, well, it's probably the typical tech story. You take VC money. What do they make you do? Hire salespeople. Do you hire too many salespeople? And and you you overgrow too fast, right? And too many that's more hoodies, that's more lunches, and you just start burning cash too fast. Well, now. It, when, when they got this round of funding, you and I calculated how much they had spent per, to acquire each uh, client. You know, they had like a thousand clients at the time, and we we took the valuation and divided it by the number of clients, and we thought this is impossible. Like they they basically really overpaid. Well, and we keep seeing this, right? We it, we saw it first with Scale Factor, realized it's harder than you think. It's harder to do now. It might be maybe pilots are rocky. We don't know, but now. People just don't learn. There's another company. I think we've talked about them on the show before, Collective. So Collective's mm -hmm. going after the freelancers, and it's the full book uh, incorporation and bookkeeping and tax. They, they do everything. You know, it's it's the similar models, right? They just got a fifty million dollar raise. So now, like, they're going to hire a bunch of salespeople and try this whole thing over. Now they're trying to say that their raise is going to really help um, invest in AI. Like they're betting that large language models are going to help them scale this this time. Mm. So. All Pro in the chat said, did you all hear about the KPMG, KPMG layoff? Very weird that they lay off auditors and tax while also talking about talent shortages. Probably short-term profit increase by making staff work more hours. And that's my bet, too, is if they're laying off anyone in audit or in tax, it's short-term thinking. But also, like, those firms, um, you know, they, the big firms have the Jack Welsh philosophy of laying off your bottom performers every year you yeah. rank everybody and you lay off the bottom performers and it lights a fire under everybody else to get their hours up right so that's also sort of a i think a performance management tool it's the yearly cycle they just do it every year type of yeah app. and then they go and hire yeah. hire new people to you know fill in it's it's the trial by fire kind of thing and hey you know i i'm not a big fan of that type of uh incentive incentivizing workers i think it's kind of dehumanizing but if it works for you, then, you know, great. And, and it, you know, if you want to work in a place like that, great. Uh, any more stories of layoffs or companies going under? No more, no more app news stories, yeah. Okay. I do. Well, you, you teased this story about um, tax prep companies sharing data with Meta. I saw that in the headlines, too. And it, and it was mainstream headlines, like CNN. Like like NBC. that level, these headlines yeah. and the way it's presented in general is this. It's really presented as big tax prep, bad big tax prep is in bed with big tech and they're sharing data, taxpayer data. Like that's really how it's presented. And Do you want me to try playing this little clip here that was on CNN? Oh, yeah, we can see what he says. Yeah. Let's see. We got to watch an ad first. Oh. We'll cut this out of the uh, episode. I'll just invoice for those. What is so what are we 
Thanks, Pete. That's now from San Francisco, Josh Constantine, a venture partner at Signal Fire, former editor at large for TechCrunch. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so looking beyond the impact on Meta, just explain what this really means in the wider implications here for other companies and for the, oh. you know, for this. Sorry, that's like an unrelated story that they just popped into this one. So, this video? All right. Zach, uh, please cut all that out. And now David's <laughs> going to explain what this story is about. Yeah. And, and so essentially the, the way it's framed up, you know, for years, the largest tax prep companies have been sharing America's sensitive financial data right, with Meta and Google. Right. And, you know, and they're saying possibly it's potentially been used, misused for targeted advertising, even though there's no real proof of that out there at this point. Um, but you know, CNN, legal experts described to CNN, this is a five alarm fire. On a scale of one to 10, this is a 15, said David uh, Valdeck, a law professor at Georgetown University and former consumer protection chief at the Federal Trade Commission, the country's okay. top privacy watchdog. So, uh, so what kind of data were, so first of all, which, which tax prep companies are involved in this? Yeah, so we will we'll, we'll talk about that as well. So you have TurboTax, who originally, so we talked about this story about eight months, seven, eight months ago, maybe six months ago, when this first broke. So TurboTax, TaxSlayer, Tax Act, and h and Block. So all of them. And at that time, I kind of explained what's happening. So a lot of you will use cookies and trackers on your websites, right? And you'll create a, you'll put the little, the most famous ones, Google Analytics. So you'll mm -hmm. track that so you can see what web pages people are going to. Right? And not just a lot what of people pages, but like what they clicked on. Yes, and... you can track the action and their behaviors, what they've clicked on. They tab to a field. You could track all this stuff about your users. And a lot of people use Google Analytics. And even then, it was discovered that Intuit was using trackers up to the sign-in page. And then they weren't using trackers. So even though they were in this, this game, they in this... Uh, these accusations, because it's the name to drop, they weren't involved as much. And there's a new report that Elizabeth Warren just dropped this week that really goes into the details. But essentially, okay, so what happens with I'm these sorry, trackers? Just to be clear. Okay. It wasn't TurboTax in this case that's the target. It's it's not tax. in the not when it comes to the report that was just re released. And okay. we're going to get into that report. So but tax essentially, layer H and R Block and Tax Act are the ones called Act, out, right? And the way to think of, and it's all the big tax prep companies, mm -hmm. right? And but. The, from a technology standpoint, the way to think about this is like every website you have has kind of a header and a footer. And usually you put these trackers kind of in either the header or the footer, a lot of times, right? And then every time you load the web page, these trackers get loaded. So if you're a company building websites, a lot of times you take your previous page and you just keep moving forward and that header just keeps moving along. So if I put something in the header, it's gonna keep being on every other page I make, right? It's just there, it's a turn on, it's on. Unless you consciously, Go out of your way to not use it, right? When, once you put that pixel in, if you have sloppy code, sloppy procedures, bad QA, it can move forward. So that's the gist of it. It's it's just being uh, being tracked. And but now there's an entire slide deck. So Elizabeth Warren and her her cronies up there in Washington, they they investigated and they came out with a 54 page report. And I, I sent you the report. So if you want to open that up, uh, do a screen share of that. You sent me the link here. Um, and she talks about how they recklessly share personal and financial data of millions of taxpayers with big tech for years. Regulators need to fully investigate and prosecute those who violated the law. It's very, very scary, right? Yeah, I mean, she makes it sound like there's this big conspiracy going on. Yes, like they're in bed together, purposely right. sharing data, right? right? That's the way it's framed. And if you look at the, uh, the PDF, and if you bring this up, just look Sorry, at the title okay. of this PDF. Where did you send me the PDF? Um, I sent it. I sent you the link in the so go out to that CNN article. It's okay. the second paragraph. There's a link. The oh, PDF. there's a link in the second paragraph. Got it. Okay, the report here. Got it. Yeah. Okay, coming up on the screen right now. Attacks on tax privacy. How the tax Very scary. Industry... And you got like a hacker looking dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, they used a stock photo of a hacker wearing the uh, the hoodie with the hood up, and you can't see his face. Yeah. Or, and or then in the face. subtitles, how the tax prep industry enabled Meta to harvest millions of taxpayers' sensitive data. That's right. right. That's the table of contents. Mm -hmm. So it's got the executive summary, right? And essentially, it talks about kind of what I kind of covered, right? You know, and the, uh, in the summary, it also talks about how Tax Act, Tax Lender, and H&R Block admitted to using the Pixel for a few years. Uh, they admitted they used uh, Google Analytics for even longer. 
Um, one company said they used 11 different pixels, right? It's very, very common practice to some extent, right? And anybody can do this. You clear your browser cache and open a website and you'll see it, right? Um, and then uh, essentially a tax acts exposed filing status, uh, approximate AGI, approximate refund amount, names of dependents, Fed tax owed, what buttons they clicked on, uh, you know, which could, could indicate more data. And so the way to think about this, if I'm tracking, and, I, and I've done this before where I've taken data and sent it to Google Analytics that was privacy data. Mm -hmm. Like if I, if I have a website and it says, Blake, do you have any dependents? And I say, type it in. And I'm tracking that you hit the button number five. I now know Blake has five dependents, right, if I'm tracking. And that's kind of what's happening here. It's not a I'm going to give data. I'm going to roll up a report of data and count it over to Google. Like it's not really that yeah. kind of uh, thing happening. But their play in this whole report is uh, they're playing on the whole concept of you as a tax preparer have to disclose where your tax data goes. Well, that, so yeah, that, that's that's something that it's a big deal. Like firms yeah. talk about this all the time. Like I have yeah. to really be careful what I do with taxpayer information. Exactly. Like under the law, a tax preparer may not disclose or use taxpayer's tax return information prior to obtaining written consent from the taxpayer. And especially so, for marketing and selling additional services to them. So yeah. like if you partner as a CPA with say a, a financial planner, you have to get express consent from your clients to share any tax information with that other firm. Exactly. And so I start to read this report. I'm like, hey, I want to read this report. I get to page four. So if you scroll down to page four, okay. and this is when the bell started going off me off that. This is a complete bullshit story <laughs> because they start out immediately saying how citizens can't file their own taxes on the IRS website. That's this is a total setup to a, to basically it's it's her agenda to be anti big tax prep and right? anti big tech. And anti-big tech. So this immediately, she doesn't even get into the details of this yet. She immediately targets the, that, the fact that there's not a return-free system that are cheaper and easier. And she talks about other countries that can do it, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Um, and just on a related news story, if we don't get to it, the IRS today basically came out and said that Congress people should create, or yesterday, that Congress people should create a simpler tax system instead of the IRS building a tax filing system. Right. Um, tax and Foundation then you, did a story on that, and and there's there. That was the story. Yeah. Oh, that was the story. Yeah. So it's, it's 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 um, it's too complicated. Like, you, it's we need tax simplification. That is the way that you solve this problem, and make it possible for people to you know just file directly with the IRS. Is is you got to have tax simplification. Yeah. It, and so if you go down to page nine, the key here is. There's a sentence at the bottom of page nine. It says potentially illegal use of sensitive taxpayer information. That's everything here is potential. They, they don't have any stories of like, oh, look, they handed this over and it was used for X. It's just all potential, potential, yeah. potential. Now, um, if you jump to 11, there's just incompetence happening at these companies. Apparently, you know, they've worked with, they've, they've spoken to all these companies and H&R Block admitted to using the... Um, Facebook pixel, but apparently H&R Block didn't know that they were also using the Google Analytics. I'm like, how do you not know this, right, at a high level, right? So, Somebody so it just shows us like, It's really, it, it, I can tell you, as a marketing guy who has installed these pixels and this code, you do it one time in like a global setting in your website builder, yeah. whatever platform you're on, HubSpot or WordPress or whatever it is, and then it just automatically is sending all this data back to <laughs> these platforms, unless you tell it not to. So, so basically, what you're saying, David, is that this was happening, and they were sending information about like income and deductions and whatnot back to Meta, but it wasn't intentional, and there's no evidence that Meta ever did anything with it. Correct. Now, to to to, to their credit, as an investigation, Meta is kind of being a jerk about it. They're not wanting to respond. They're not open to conversations. They're reluctant to to engage about this. Like they're just well, giving them the silent surprising. treatment. Um, because they also know that she's coming after them and a bunch of other things. Yeah. Um, but again, they argue that they didn't get consent. And they have a bunch of examples on slides 26 through 34 where they show the terms of service, when this was discovered, and how they changed yeah, yeah. the term of service and the websites and the products. And then if you get down to uh, page 39, their conclusion. Again, they use that word potentially, but then they demand, they want investigations by four government agencies, the DOJ, IRS, TIGTA, and FTC. Yeah. Right? And, but from the whole document, from what I can tell, 
there is no known like agreement or a biz dev deal or marketing deal with big tax and Meta and Google to share this data. Like it's yeah. just not in this doc. But the headlines though make it seem like 15 out of 10 fire, right? Like they made this just seem so bad. Now, my thing where, where I really think this is bullshit is we can go and we're going to switch screens and screen share here. I can go to the IRS website after I'm logged in and see that it's sending data to Google about my clicks on the IRS website. Okay, so let me so uh, here's your screen. shift over. And now I'm confused how to switch to my screen. There we go, we got it. All right, so I'm gonna, um, I'm signed in right now. I mean, I'm not signed in, I'm signed out. So I'm gonna, I mean, this is basically a debugger. And if you look, so I have Firefox and Firefox blocks trackers. Okay. So all these reds are when tracking is happening and Firefox is blocking the send. So if you see like these are posts, mm -hmm. that means right here, it's when I load this page, it's posting to Google Analytics. Now you can't really read that fully. So I'm gonna sign into my account. So it's chugging along. It's hitting lots of different trackers. It, um, it actually Qual Qualtrics, you're familiar with that company. Mm -hmm. They're a big mm -hmm. tracking company, it hits them. So I'm gonna sign in with my ID.me. And if you see all these reds flash by on the screen, these are trackers, Google Analytics, Zendesk, right? It, because I'm using ID.me, it's touching Zendesk for some reason. Well, now I have to type in my OAuth code here. Do, 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 do. So now you are you are signing into the IRS using ID.me. 375. Three seven. Whoops. Three seven. And you're putting in your multi-factor authentication two, two, code, four. like a like a good citizen. There we go. Well, I'd sign, I signed. I thought I was going to trust that. And you can see these things fly by. Those are the red things. All these trackers are happening. Dun, okay. Dun, dun. So now, so are, you, are you saying the IRS website is sending? I am on the IRS.gov yeah. logged in to my account, and if you see, analytics data is being sent. Mm -hmm. about what page I'm on, what I'm clicking on. I'm going to go to uh, make a payment. So like if you make a payment, is the amount sent back to some sort of tracker? I didn't go that deep, right? Like, <laughs> like, because that, like if that... I had 40 hours of QA work, being somebody that came in from a QA background, I, yeah. I, I would not be surprised if the IRS sends personal taxpayer data back. So they're sending data that says I clicked make a payment. It's yeah. right there. So this is complete bullshit. Like, you're criticizing these big tax companies for doing exactly what the IRS is doing. Well, we don't know that for sure. You need to do some more investigation okay. to figure out okay. if it's sending personal information, like information about your payment. That would be something that would be a big no-no, I think, how yeah. much you're paying. And it, um, but, but this is a QA issue, right? This is a, did somebody test all the data that's being sent? Now, maybe right. somebody at the IRS did, right? And but it's I'm super clean they and they're didn't. super confident. Yeah, I'm willing to bet they didn't. They probably exactly. have a similar problem. Well, we don't know so, for sure, but so now let's step back to the logic of this whole thing. They they didn't purposely send data over, but they want to prosecute them on this, right? Mm -hmm. It's a it's a it's a fine of a thousand dollar per instance. There's a one year jail time. But going by the logic of this, if you have a firm and you have Google Analytics set up, and your clients are accessing that thing, you basically they they. The same argument can be made about every tax preparer out there who has a website that their clients use or sign well, into a portal. If the clients are using that portal and submitting personal information and your portal is sending that back to a tracker. And I 100% guarantee you every app you're using is sending data to Google Analytics. Well, the question is, are they sending that kind of data? Well, that's It's the, one thing to talk about a button. Not purposely, click. not purposely. Again, right. like I've done this on accident. Right. Like, so... It's easy so, to do on accident. We don't know this an, for sure. It's easy to do on accident. They do it for a decade before they noticed they were doing it, basically, right? Yeah. It, it, but it's there's no way to accuse all these other people of doing it when you're okay. doing it yourself. Stop using Google Analytics then too, IRS. Right? I'm sure if I go to Elizabeth Warren's website, there's 50 trackers. Right? Well, David, it's, it, that's it. Really has me bothered because it's just yeah. this. They're scaring. It, it's political fodder. Right, yeah. like she should be making tax codes simpler. That's what she That's should right. be doing. I agree with you on that. Like this is this is not what to focus on. This is not going to make our lives better. Well, David, it's exciting to see you get up on your soapbox and get passionate. I know. I know. About it's been a little while. It's been a little. Because normally while. it's me. Normally it's me. I'm the one yelling through the mic, and you're 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 turning the volume down because it's too loud. Well, I'm waiting uh. for the ICPA to issue a warning to tax preparers, like, hey, Elizabeth Warren could be coming after you, <laughs> if if you're using Google Analytics or a Meta Facebook Pixel or any of these trackers. Well, hey, uh, I got a, a red meat story for myself. Red meat uh, this right. week. This is good. Yeah, red meat. Like this is, you know, I've, I've grabbed onto this with my teeth. 
And the Wall Street Journal just keeps on delivering these juicy stories. And this one is, headline is, the accountant shortage is showing up in financial statements. Advanced Auto Parts and others have cited a lack of skilled accounting personnel for material weaknesses in their financial reporting controls, a key predictor of restatements. It's an article by Mark Marer in the CFO Journal. U.S. listed companies such as car parts provider Advanced Auto Parts, electric air taxi firm Joby Aviation, and German biotech company Evotech in recent months have disclosed efforts to address material weaknesses due at least in part to a lack of accounting staff. The disclosures come as fewer people are pursuing degrees in accounting and entering the field, resulting in more positions open and for longer periods of time. What's more, academics say the shortage will likely be compounded as more accountants retire without a robust pipeline of replacements. So we're starting to see the accounting talent shortage result in real risks to our capitalist system. If we don't have reliable financial statements, then how can investors and the stock market work? It doesn't and work. They disclose this, right? But yeah. how many companies right now are maybe falling behind on some stuff and aren't disclosing that this is the reason? Yeah, right. So this could be the tip of the iceberg, right? And if you go back to the article, the image. Yeah. I see there. Like I see that they at auto parts, they, they sponsor like some NASCAR. It's all branded up. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe the ICPA should sponsor a NASCAR like that and say, like, we need accountants. Like, come <laughs> be an accountant. Like it could be a it could be one of the pipe now there could be 13 things in the pipeline plan to to fill the pipeline. They sponsor NASCAR. Yeah. So I forgot where I was gonna go with that story, but well, um meet. Oh, oh meet, yeah, right? I, I remember now. So um Yesterday, was it yesterday? No, the day before, I got to meet somebody who you and I have met online, but I have not met in person, Jerry McGinnis, yeah. who was the office managing partner at KPMG Philadelphia. He was previously the um, uh, head of the Pennsylvania Institute of CPAs and really an influential guy, uh, audit partner. Um, running. He's KPMG. great. I met him face to face as well. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And he has written a book uh, about you know how to succeed in the accounting profession uh, for students. And he goes around and he talks to students at colleges and universities. He is working. He is in the trenches trying to recruit accountants. And he's very passionate about the profession. It was so great talking to him about all of this stuff, the talent shortage and all that. And you know, uh, he agrees. Like this is a big problem, uh, and we are not doing enough about it as a profession. The state societies and AICPA are not doing enough. You know, we've got this 150-hour problem that that is deterring people from becoming accountants because they got to do an extra year of education. So, I, I want to get him on the show sometime to kind of give that big firm uh, partner perspective because we don't hear enough from them about this. And I feel like part of the reason is because bigger firms discourage anyone other than the CEO from being out there in public. You don't hear about it. You know, you don't see them talking. And he's, I guess, at a, at a stage of his life cycle and career where there's not a risk for him to, he, he, he can afford to have a dissenting opinion because yeah. he, he's kind of, I wouldn't say he's made it in life, but he's at, he's at a different phase. Like if you're, if you're mid career, it's hard for you to, you know, buck the system a little bit. You could risk career promotions. You could risk a lot, right? Yeah. And I think he's probably past that phase. And then uh, you want to say the title of his book because it's very, very long? Yes. Uh -huh. um, let me pull that up. Yeah. And the, for called... those of you listeners that want to hear a book review or a book club, if you want to get the book and participate, the Accounting Twins have done a book club of every chapter of this book. Um, and you can listen, read along and listen along. Yeah, this is called Advice for a Successful Career in the Accounting Profession, How to Make Your Assets Greatly Exceed Your Liabilities. You can get it on Amazon, either Kindle, audiobook, or hardcover. So check it out. And it's an easy read. He really breaks it down in small chunks, depending on where you're at. If you're, what, what you should do to finish up your schooling as a student, what you should do you know, in each little phases of your career as an early accountant. All Pro says, I don't think they can fix the hours since the work has to be done. I think what one of you suggested, having a partner show off a really nice car to college kids, <laughs> is the best way to recruit. LOL. That was your suggestion, David, yeah. is that more partners buy nice cars. <laughs> well, the problem is that, that uh, they, need, they need to pay the, the like senior staff and the managers a little more so they can have the nice cars, right? Then the staff will want to get those promotions.
They don't want to wait to be partner. They don't want to wait 10 years. And that's how long it takes on average. It's like 10 to 15 years to become partner. And just people aren't willing to do that anymore. Kira says, as an accounting major and aspiring CPA still early in her education, I feel like a hero with what I'm getting myself into. Kira, you are a hero. Yes. Thank you for joining the profession. It's a great profession if you find the right place for yourself. Um, and, and there are many, many awesome firms, and especially the really progressive, small, remote firms like Merrill's firm, um, Merrill Johnson, who we spoke to in our last episode, which actually hasn't come out on the podcast feed yet as we record this, but will be out on the podcast feed and on YouTube uh, very shortly. Um, or if you're listening to this right now on the podcast, it's already released. So go listen to the episode with Merrill in whatever timeline you are in right now. And, and the thing to remember, I think, if you're young getting in this space, you can go to work for the big four. That's fine. Go work for them for two years. Burn out. But just remember, you don't have to leave the accounting industry. Like you could go there, get grind it out, get the experience, be able to have that badge that says, I did the two years at a, at a big four firm. But don't leave the accounting industry. There's plenty of other things to do. And there's lots of options as a career beyond that. But just mm -hmm. if you do go down that path, just make sure you keep that in your mind that, oh, this is just a teeny, or a big piece of the whole accounting industry. But you don't have to work. You know, It's not the only piece of this industry. You know? Tim says in the chat, Jerry never had an issue with the 150 credit rule when he implemented it in Pennsylvania as president. Ouch. I mean, here's what I'll give to him uh, on that is I'll say he admits it was a mistake. Well, he didn't exp expressly say that to me, but he thinks that it needs to change. And I feel like part of the problem in the profession right now is that a lot of the people leading the societies and leading AICPA and NASBA were part of that move to make it happen and will not admit it was a mistake. I'm trying to think. Um, Romeo says, do software engineers show off their wealth? Um, you know what I see them doing a lot is showing off their travel and going to crazy places like Bali and working there for a month. Uh, I see that on social media. I don't see they buy a lot of BMWs in the Bay area. They, they buy a lot of BMWs for sure. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of that. HK says, yes. Can we talk more about career paths that are not big four related? I think that's also another way to solve the talent crisis is, uh, we have a retention problem, right? People go into big firms, they leave after a couple of years and they leave accounting entirely because they get burned out. And I feel like we need to destigmatize going to smaller firms. These accounting professors at these colleges are stuck in this mindset that, oh, you got to go work for KPMG or PwC or Deloitte or EY because that's what I did. And that was the career path. And you can't be successful unless you do that. And I think that's totally false now. I think you can go work for a small firm. You can go work directly for a tech startup. I've interviewed people on my Earmark podcast who did that and are now CFOs. Um, if you are willing to learn, you do not have to follow a traditional path that was, you know, what people did 20, 30, 40 years ago. Like the world has changed and it's changed I, really rapidly. I saw somebody, I don't know if it's Twitter, LinkedIn, I don't know, TikTok, who knows? Like something flew by in my feed somewhere. And essentially the, the argument was if you're a young CPA, because everybody, every, the reason people try to go to the big four is they want that experience. Oh, you're going to exposed, mm -hmm. you're going to get such great experience. And I, I think uh, this person's argument was to... Go take a job at a company that's kind of growing fast, and you'll have to wear so many hats. the The learning you'll you'll get in that type of environment is probably just good, if not equal. To... And you know, but I I have a question about that that argument that oh, you learned so much in your years at the Big Four, because I rarely get a detailed description of what exactly did you learn when you spent a year auditing cash. You know, like I I don't think you actually really learned that much, and it might be survivor bias that the people who did it. Uh, speak fondly of it because they survived it and they have to justify it in their minds. I, I'm not saying that's true, but like it could be possible. And well, how, do I mean, you know, how do you know that you wouldn't have gotten just as valuable experience somewhere else? Because you didn't go somewhere else. You only had one experience, yeah. right? Um, and I suspect if you take somebody like out of that three year, third year in, you pull them out and drop them to some cast form. They don't know QuickBooks, they don't know the apps. They don't know how to do oh, yeah. bookkeeping. Right? No, like, I've, so. I've, I've heard, I've actually it's heard great bad stories about like people who come out of big four and go to work for a small firm and don't know how to do anything. Oh, that reminds they've never, me. They've never booked a journal entry. It reminds me of one of your articles about account tests because account tests will test people before you 
hire them, but didn't they do something? You wrote a blog post or something? Oh, yeah. I oh. love this. Um, I just want to get to some of the chat because we got a lot oh, of chat. Okay, okay, yeah, totally. Then, the chat's can going. I talk about that? Yeah. Um, so Kira said, my main incentive for getting into accounting was simply to get out of poverty. That was enough of a pull factor for me. And I, I think this is something that um, is a problem where like, we, we have a talent shortage, but we create all these barriers to entry in our profession that really discourage people who don't have a lot of money, right? The extra year of education is, is expensive. And it's really expensive when you consider the opportunity cost of not working. And you know, you're asking people to basically spend fifty dollars to $100,000 in actual hard costs and opportunity costs to do that. And you think that's, that's not going to discourage people? I mean, maybe if you're a CPA, a society leader who's making you know, half a million to a million dollars a year, then yeah, to you, that's not a lot of money. But to somebody who came up and doesn't have a lot of money and whose parents don't make a lot of money and who had to take on a lot of loans, that is a lot of money. And you're just totally out of touch if you don't see that. Yeah, and, and that's the psychology part, right? Because you already and, you just dropped fifty thousand dollars a year for the last four years. Now somebody wants you to do it one more time. <laughs> and this is what's sad is that accounting is, I think, possibly the most reliable way to get in and stick in the middle class in this country, right? Good job security, decent pay. Um, you know, we we talk about how the pay is low compared to tech salaries and whatnot, but like. The pay for you know staff accountants compared to most jobs in this country is good, and the benefits are good, and the job is good, and and as long as you you know don't screw up really bad, you are going to have a good career. Um, and and we yet we put up these barriers that discourage people who would love to have that kind of job from getting into it, and especially the career changers. It's yeah. really hard to become a career changer because there's all these specific courses you got to take. You got to take that fifth year. The prep for the CPA exam is expensive if you don't have a firm paying for it. It's time consuming. It's it's difficult uh, trying to book this stuff. Just like get through the whole NASBA process to get your CPA exam. It's a bureaucratic nightmare. And then the transcript submission and all that. I mean, to navigate that is really hard. And um, I don't think it adds value. So, oh, and then HK says, yes, and start your own business with little to no overhead. And that is the path to not just the middle class, but to the upper middle class is you start your own firm and now, I mean, you, your earning potential is hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And it's maybe really, that should be played up more, that, that you basically, a Starbucks and a laptop and you can start an accounting firm. Yeah. You can, you can own your own small business and be a member of the business owner community and you could do that coming from almost nothing. But we put all these barriers in place, you know, and we stop people from doing that. Um, all right, I love every I love all the chatter going on in on YouTube. Um, I would love to address it all, but we got to move on to uh, another story here, which is the Accountess Chat GPT challenge. So we have had chat uh, we have had Giles Pearson on the show. He is the CEO of Accountess, former PwC tax partner in New Zealand. And uh, account test, if you haven't heard of it, it's a, a skills test platform specifically for accountants. Um, if you want to hire somebody and you want to make sure they know their debits and credits, or you want to make sure they're a good personality fit, or you want to make sure, you know, all this stuff, um, you can give them an online test from account test and, and check it out. And I'm stalling for time because I'm trying to find the article. Here we go. <laughs> so... Accountess did an experiment. They gave ChatGPT the Accountess debits and credits test. This is a 20-question test where um, it's, it's designed to evaluate, do you know your debits and credits? Given a particular situation, could you book the journal entry? And ChatGPT, ChatGPT4, scored an 18 out of 20 on the test, which is better than the cutoff score of 15 out of 20. So in order to demonstrate competency, you're supposed to score 15 out of 20, and ChatGPT got 18 out of 20, 90%. Uh, I think that's pretty spectacular. Especially if you compare it to probably the people applying for the jobs in general. Um, I remember the one summer I took a moonlighted at an accounting firm for a summer and when I was still working into it and doing QuickBooks tech support stuff. And I got they gave me a little quiz on debits and credits and county equation that's mm -hmm. and they were shocked like shocked that i was 
I got them all right. Right. And because apparently the rest of the other people applying just couldn't get half of them right or a third of them right. And yeah. it's, and so you're right. So if ChatGPT is knocking out 19 out of 20, it's 18 out of 20. Or 18 out of 20. So, it's, it's impressive. Right. Well, and what it indicates is that ChatGPT could be utilized in combination with software to book a lot of journal entries to categorize transactions, not just categorize them, but actually like do something more complex, like a loan payment. Um, what did it get wrong though? That's what everyone really wants to know, right? What are the two problems it missed? So the first question it got wrong was related to a bank overdraft while correctly identifying that a bank overdraft would be a liability and insisted it would have a debit balance. The second question related to a journal entry, debit, vehicle expenses, credit, owner's draw. ChatGPT correctly identified that a debit to vehicle expense was an increase in an expense, but seems stuck on a credit to draw as being a withdrawal of cash from the business. After going back twice to point out the error in its logic, ChatGPT got the answer right and gave a nice apology for getting it wrong. Um, so it learned also because when, when Giles asked the same question a week later, it got it right. So what this indicates to me is oh, that- Oh, it actually stuck. Stuck. Yeah, so, so remember, ChatGPT is not trained specifically on accounting knowledge. It was just trained on a giant data database that may include some of that. And so imagine how good it can get if it's trained specifically on journal entries. Like if you gave it uh, 10,000 journal entries that are correct, that are known to be correct, and then you gave it more journal entries, I, I bet you it could get to very close to 100%. Or how and you, last week you demoed the um, Avalara plugin for tax uh -huh. yep. information. Like there should be a plugin for accounting transactions. Yeah, like how would like a journal entry plugin? That would be cool if somebody made that. Actually, I'm um, surprised nobody's making that for all. And we're getting pitched a lot for all of you uh, AI companies that are out there. Everybody's making their own like version of an AI product with accounting stuff in it of some type. And it's like, why not just make a plugin and have everybody? It's it, like I don't want ten different chat programs. Like I need to use this one for tax and this other chat program for um, revenue rack and this other. Like I just want just offer plugins to chat GPT maybe yeah it's probably better out um, there's also a new app that people should check out if you want to uh, try a different option other than chat GPT it's called Claude.ai, spelled C L A U D E dot A I um, one thing that makes it really neat is that you can copy paste text that is a lot longer than what chat GPT can handle so for instance, I could paste this entire transcript from this episode into Claude and start asking it questions about the episode where I couldn't do that before with ChatGPT because it was limited. So it can also ingest PDFs. So you could take like a PDF, I, I don't know how big a PDF it can handle, but you could take a PDF of uh, like a particular section of the tax code, drop it in and start querying it. Or maybe uh, uh, like a, a gap rule, like something like that that's where we're gonna get is, is the ability to reference your own material and then ask questions specifically about that. And it, that will minimize hallucinations and maximize accuracy. Um, the other thing that I've been doing with GPT that's really exciting, David, is I took a set of financial statements, now that it can handle more text, um, and I did this with ChatGPT. I, I, I took a set of financials and I, exported a PDF from zero, and then I converted the PDF into just plain text. So, you know, it, it turns the, the columns into tabs. So it's kind of roughly like you can, you can see the, where the alignment happens. Yep. And GPT is smart enough where it can actually reassemble the tables, the, the financial statements. And so I just copied and pasted the text of the financial statements into ChatGPT, and I asked it, give me five bullet points to give to my client the most important things they need to know about their June financials. Cause I still have one client, by the way, I got permission to do this. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not doing this. Um, I'm not going rogue with their data. Well, you can use our company if you want. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, it gave me the best analysis that was better than what I would have ever given them in an email. Cause it would have taken me forever to write it. And it gave me these five bullet points explaining, here's the things you need to worry about. Here's your cash flow thing. Here's your assets, liabilities thing, like you're upside down on this. And it, it was it was fantastic. 
And then I could go, I could look at the financials and verify, validate that information and then send that to my client. So think about this. There's a future now where you could add a ton of value to your client accounting services by running the financials through GPT, asking it to create that bullet point summary for your client and emailing that along with the financials to your client. Yeah. That's well, I mean, one of our sponsors, different. one of our sponsors, Thin Daily, like we'll pull data and send an email every day, but you're right. That would be the next step. Like, like take the data, pass it to Zapier, pull it back in and, and send that little paragraph or yeah. the five bullets of today or whatever, you know, things to watch. Your, yeah. your clients aren't going to open up that PDF and look at the financials. Like the vast no. majority of them will not do it at best 50%. Far fewer though is my guess, but they will read the bullet points in the email and that will stimulate conversations. And that's a way to get into advisory. So I'm really excited about that. But David, um, I'm sorry if you had more to share, but I, I got to go. I've got a call. We and, just have to um, plug one thing before, you, before everybody. Well, Blake and I use TurboTax Live full service business to do our business return. And it was a three, four week process and we turned it into one sweet video. And by the time you listen to this podcast, it should be available. But Blake, you're, you're more of a YouTuber. You're younger than me. Can you explain like where they're going to find this video? Well, search for The Accounting Podcast on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. You can join us live and get notified on your phone when we go live and chat with us and hang out with us. Um, you can see our screens. We're also going to drop that video into the podcast as an audio episode. So I, I don't know who's going to listen to this, honestly, David. Like, I, I, It was an experiment. Will our listeners actually want to spend 45 minutes listening to us do our taxes? <laughs> it's the big question. Well, I, I honestly believe this to be a truth. Most of tax Twitter, and I just picked a fight with tax Twitter, but most of tax Twitter, most tax preparers, a lot of them bag on into it. They bag on TurboTax, they bag on this, but nobody's ever done the experience. And that's right. what we've done. We've done the experience. You can come watch it. So like, that's the reason yourself. to watch it is, is to look at what TurboTax Live is doing and compare it to how your firm is operating. And Especially I would the say, price. And, and look at the price because it, it, you know, and see what they're, they're charging for what they're giving and see how you line up. Yeah. Maybe you're doing better. Maybe you're doing worse. You got to know, right? If you want to be competitive. So David, great to see you. Um, follow David at David Leary on all the socials. I'm at Blake T. Oliver. We'll see you here next week. Bye, everybody.